Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hollywood Squares, Controversies in Cochlear Implantation. I'm really honored to be with you all this morning and to do basically one of my favorite things, which is to talk about cochlear implantation. So I named this panel Hollywood Squares, not because we're going to mimic the game of Hollywood Squares, but because I know all of us wish we were together in Los Angeles with uh, the opportunity to talk and be together. And although we're not near Hollywood, we are gonna try to replicate some of those discussions and interactions that we have. So this hour is gonna be a little different. I wanna start by thanking my panelists for being willing to try something a little different and for the audience as well. This is gonna be a case-based interactive panel focusing on current challenges and controversies in cochlear implantation. We're going to have a total of nine cases that are going to go through challenges in pre-op or candidacy, intraoperative issues, as well as some post-operative issues. So I don't know about yourself, but for me, one of the greatest points of being at meetings is sometimes grabbing your colleague or your friend and saying, hey, I have this case. What do you think? Sometimes you don't always just want to know what exactly they would do, but even what they think about or how they conceptualize that problem or what they do at their institution. And I'm hoping that today we're not only going to get away a tiny bit from the more traditional Zoom format where uh, we're talking more at you, but get a chance to really replicate some of those conversations. So. This morning, as mentioned, we have just a fantastic panel. Uh, we have Christine Din from the University of Miami. We have Hassam El Kashlan from the University of Michigan. We have Walter Coots from UT Southwestern in Texas. And we have Mia Miller from very close to actual Hollywood uh, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, our panelists are coming to us this morning from across the United States, as all of you watching are as well, and international. We have all of our disclosures listed both on the um, ANS platform and also on the um, HOVA platform that you're currently watching on, and I would encourage you to take a look at those. So let's get started in what we're going to actually be doing this morning. So this is going to be our sort of case uh, selection slide, and as you can see here, I have nine cases across a bunch of different um, sections of cochlear implants. Three cases in the preoperative, three in intraoperative, and three in the postoperative. So I, this is going to be a lot less like a board exam and much more like Terry Gross interviewing someone on NPR. So a little more informal. And a lot of the cases are one-liners intended to spur discussion about controversies and challenges that we're actually seeing in our clinical practice. For everyone watching, please feel free to type into the Q&A uh, questions for everyone on the panel or for specific panelists, and we'll definitely wanna bring those in uh, to our discussion. So we're gonna start alphabetically. Christine, you're at the top here. Um, where would you like to start? Pre-op, intra-op, head to the end? You let me know. Mara, yeah. thank you for having me. I'm gonna start at the top and at the top. So preoperative case number one. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to read the case here. This is a 63 year old who has right sided <laughs> profound sensory neural hearing loss for about 18 years. And even though she's 63, her left side has normal hearing. In that right side, she has severe tinnitus. She's had this for a long time, but it's getting worse. She's tried a lot of extensive therapy. She's done neuromonics, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. She's even tried hypnosis. She is suffering from both tinnitus and hearing loss. So I thought I would just jump right out to ask you, in this setting, do you think that cochlear implantation has a role and specifically, do you talk to your patients about um, patients who have single-sided deafness about the length of deafness in that year? Um, so I guess with regards to this patient, it's very complicated because you're dealing with two different things, hearing loss and tinnitus. And in some respects, they're kind of interrelated and in some other respects, they're probably not. Um, I think that um, just in general, cochlear implantation, there's a lot of 
data that says that, you know, cochlear implants can improve hearing, can improve word recognition. And yes, she's 18 years out. And perhaps that's a poor prognostic factor um, in her cochlear implant outcome. But for I feel for a lot of the patients that the sky is the limit. Um, there are many things that we can talk about and uh, address. Um, usually, I'll sit my patient down and I'll say, okay, well, these are the problems that you're going to face. Cochlear implant um, tation may not help with your hearing or may not help with your hearing as much as you think it will. Um, number two, um, cochlear implants may help with your tinnitus, but um, um, it may not. I am very realistic with my patients and I go through all of the risks, especially with regards to cochlear implant outcomes. You may need to put in a lot of um, a lot of time, a lot of practice. Um, we need to have you work with the audiologist um, uh, to see if we can find like the best parameters to get you to kind of like uh, the, uh, the best um, outcome as possible. Um, I guess um, in general, if I'm talking to this patient and she wants the cochlear implant for the purposes of tinnitus, I feel like perhaps that's probably not the most realistic of expectations. Perhaps we can get her tinnitus better with the cochlear implant, but if she has garble going through that cochlear implant and is not hearing very much of anything that is very useful, is she really going to use that cochlear implant um, to help with help her tinnitus? Um, so I go through all of these different scenarios with the patient um, with the uh, um, obviously with a positive outlook because, you know, the sky is the limit. Um, I do also think that the 18 years of um, um, being deaf in that ear can, it can affect outcomes, but I feel like we could definitely do things that perhaps may improve that outcome, such as perhaps programming um, the cochlear implant to improve those um, uh, 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 hearing as well as, um, uh, uh, I guess, promote neuroplasticity in these patients? That's a great, you know, that was a really comprehensive answer. Hassan. Uh, just a, a great answer. Just a, a little bit of addition, maybe uh, something that you can think of, um, you know, doing a promontory, stim, you know, prom stim for this uh, patient, this particular patient. Yeah. And he actually, number one, if she can hear the tones, and have you know kind of a, a the the rec pattern recognition and so forth, and whether or not when she is hearing them is her tinnitus reduced, or her perception of her own tinnitus is reduced, and if so, then you might be a little bit more encouraged, uh, and, and at least again with no guarantees, but at least you know there's some measure that you were trying ahead of time to see if that actually would work or not. You still can do it even if it doesn't, or you know, not do it if it would. But it just it gives some more information. Great, yeah, Mia, did you have a comment? Yeah, just uh, one other thing to think about is I think there's good data that uh, cochlear implants can help with tinnitus, um, but you have to be wearing the implant. And so if the tinnitus is most bothersome at night or during a time when the patient wouldn't typically wear the implant, you know, they, that might not be controlled at that time. And so I think it's really important to talk up to patients about tinnitus suppression with implants and, you know, it works when you're wearing the implant, but not always when you take it off. Yes, Walt. Um, so Hussam, I, I agree with the prom stem is a good idea. The problem is I think a lot of centers don't have a prom stem system. We have a very old system. I'll usually use that for patients. Maybe they had a cochlear, I mean, acoustic neuroma removed or an NF2 patient, but you're fortunate to have a very good system, but that that's a great idea if you have that. Um, Christine yeah. and Mia, do you guys have prom stem in your clinics? If, we do. Yeah. Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. You're that's absolutely right, though. Idea. You know, a lot of places do not. We don't. And we recently discussed this at the New York Otologic Society. Maybe your um, states have regional societies and very few places have that. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's very helpful and often comes up. Well, let me ask you, do you um, for single sided deafness implantation, do you have a time frame? Do you have a limit where um, either a, a hard and fast limit or a, a soft one that you use? You know, I, I, I don't think the data is really there to, I, I've read through it and try to, and I think every patient is very different and that's, what's yeah. interesting and challenging about cochlear implants. Um, you know, I sort of think 10 years, you know, at past 10 years, um, I think the, that's somewhat arbitrary, but I've, I've heard that among discussions of, of other ex of, of experts and 
you know, then you're sort of, you know, really playing down expectations. And I thought Christine's answer was very good. You know, when I tell patients like for hearing benefit or tinnitus, it's all expectations. I said, listen, if you're a nine out of 10 in severity now, if we can get you to four out of 10, wouldn't that be great? And oftentimes patients will buy into that. Um, yeah. I think it's unrealistic. And this is something I've learned in my career is, you know, it's just, a, it's not an all or none. So when you get over 10 years, you know, you really start talking about expectations. You know, they're profoundly deaf. It's, um, and, you know, for most of our hands, it's a low risk procedure. But if they go through all that, it's not helpful, then that's a problem. But I would say 10 years is sort of a rough guide. I don't know. If, I'd be inter interested uh, if anyone else has a kind of a, a somewhat of a, a nebulous year. Yes, Christine, Christine, do you have any hard and fast rules about the time? I don't. I don't. And I used to take care of the veteran community who have been deaf for many, many years before they had a cochlear implant surgeon in their VA hospital. So um, regardless of whether they were 10 years or 20 years deaf, mm -hmm. I would put the cochlear implant in mm -hmm. and they would do amazing. Perhaps they're not my best performers, but they are doing much better than probably what, you know, what the literature may may probably um, um, uh um, direct you to think. I also think that over the years, people have a, a person that's deaf in one ear may lose auditory memory. Like something that is a normal volume to us um, may be very loud to that person um, once they get a cochlear implant and we're starting to stimulate them. And so if you let the patient tell you, okay, this is the best volume for me, perhaps that volume is much lower than somebody who has had auditory memory or had an implant, I guess, implanted sooner. So sometimes we at the University of Miami start to um, play around with the programming to be able to actually challenge them, push them beyond their limits and get them at a very high stimulation level to be able, and they have to work through it because it's a kind of painful, annoying process, but I think that you can get better outcomes uh, through programming. That's an excellent point. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I have definitely seen my very talented CI audiologist say, we're going to turn it up just a little bit, but in reality, really trying to get those patients used to it. And it, it uh, the benefits are definitely there. Great point. All right, let's change it up for a different case. Hassam, you're, feel free. The, uh, the, the world's your oyster there in terms of choices. Let's uh, change gears and intraoperative case one. All right, let's go for it. Intraoperative case one. Okay, this is a this is a really open one, and gosh, we can't have a cochlear implant discussion without getting into electrodes. So we're just going to actually go right around the the group here, and if you could each just give kind of a short answer for what is your electrode choice in a case where hearing preservation is unclear. So I made it ambiguous on purpose. Uh, where their low frequency PTA may be around 50 decibels. So Hassan, you're the lucky picker. What do you think? So generally speaking, again, um, it, it's in my hands now in, in this scenario, if I'm picking something, I'll, I will pick the, uh, uh, the cochlear 632. So the kind of pyramid dialer, but the slim. Um, used to uh, use this, the 22 the electrode, the 622, and, and we still use it uh, often. Uh, but uh, for me, there has the, the lateral electrode, which is a 622 is, um, probably have a, a little bit more um, incident and chance of hearing preservation than the 632, which was not designed to be a, a hearing preservation electrode, but uh, because of, uh, if you really follow, like when we did the study initially, there was a significant number of people who actually preserved their hearing, um, just following the, the, the rules that we were using in the, in the study. Um, so the uh, audiologists found that the 1622 can be, or the, the 22 electrode, the straight slim electrode can be, the performance can be variable because of its lateral electrode and some people do great, some people don't do not as well. Um, and as a group, and uh, uh, even uh, the, the programming and stuff can pose a little bit more challenge than the perimodular electrodes. So uh, personally, I have uh, converted to the, six, the, the 32 electrode, the, sim, the perimodular mm -hmm. sim electrode when I'm trying to preserve hearing um, in the ear, don't promise anything. 
Yeah. And I would say I looked at my uh, results and, and they're around 60 to 65% being yeah. able to preserve uh, within a 10 dB, um, you know, from the pre-op. Well, I love your use of the word convert because maybe some of us aren't so much converts. Sometimes I think that's, uh, you know, we might come down on the lateral wall or the perimedialer. So let's just go around the, the group there. Uh, Walt, what, what, any preferences? What do you think? Yeah, I, I would probably just let the patient, we, we offer all three implants, let the patient mm -hmm. choose. And, you know, if it was advanced bonics, I'd use it. The Slim J. Um, Coker actually like the 2-2 electrode. It's no nonsense. I can, you know, I just feel like I can place that gently. Um, and um, and then metal, I'd probably have a 28 flex, yeah. flex 28. And, and um, you know, I preserve hearing and, and hasn't pre preserved hearing with all those electrodes. So that's that would be my approach. Mia, what do you think? I like the 622. Um, I feel like with the 632, I don't see as well, and I can't see and control the insertion as well with soft surgical technique. Um, and if a patient has a strong preference for a specific implant, I'm, I'm with Walt, I'll let them choose, and I've preserved hearing you know, with all three. But if it's up to me, I like the 22, 622. Christine, all right, what do you think? Um, I... I think I'm a convert too. I feel like the 632 has some benefits to it, especially with regards to programming. I do love to work with my audiologist and talk to them. And I find that working with the 622 um, for them is very challenging to overcome some things such as fibrosis or high impedances um, to get patients um, good electrical hearing, um, you know, in addition to, you know, acoustic hearing. Um, but I do believe at the, at the University of Miami, we do allow patients to choose. Um, so we provide them all of the different options and they may choose one or the other. And I'm kind of also like Walter, is, um, uh, the Slim J, if it's uh, the um, Advanced Bionics, uh, the Flex 28, if it's the Medal, um, except I like the 632 um, if it was for, if it was a cochlear. Uh, yeah, say something. We we yeah. do allow patients to choose, and that, yeah. I don't want to give the impression that <laughs> no, we, no, yeah. we offer all three, and we we offer the patients. You know, they they yeah. choose, but I would say the majority of them choose cochlear, and and if they do, then that's what I would use. Yes, I think obviously, um, I think all of us have device choice uh, at, at our institutions and that's influenced by a tremendous number of factors, everything from color to what the actual electrode looks like. So I think uh, this was just an attempt. So we'll, we'll head back to the main screen. Let's move on to, to a different one. I think, um, uh, Walt, you're, you're up here. What do you think for the next one? Well, let's keep the theme going. We'll go post-operative case one. All right, post-operative case one, all right. So this is something that I think we all struggle with, and I thought we could get some perspectives on how each of us in our institutions. This is a 60-year-old male, good speech perception outcomes, but the processor's not sticking even after three months of wearing it. Now, I did say we're all struggling with it, so perhaps you could just let us know, Do you have? are you having, a, with the advent of magnetic um, MRI compatibility magnets, we're having a couple issues there. Are you having any of these challenges? We haven't had, I've been lucky. I've not had this situation rise, even being in Texas. Everybody's a little, little yeah, thicker right. in Texas, but Everything is surprisingly, <laughs> yeah, surprisingly, it, it, you know, and this, this can happen. Um, you know, I, I guess what I would, you could talk about some different options. I usually, our audiologist will be able to get a stronger magnet, but it sounds like this patient's tried the strongest magnet, worked with the companies. Yeah. Um, you know, you could try a sticker magnet, you know, like you do for an ABI when you take the right. magnet out, it's, it's a real pain. You've got to shave that area. It doesn't stick that great. And then you can, sure. you can, you know, go in there and I'd probably make a U-shaped incision around the receiver simulator or around the magnet, staying away from the implant and then thin the scalp and close it. I think that yeah. would be the solution if you had to, had to go. Anybody else, anybody in the group, um, having these kinds of, um, challenges in the post-op period with um, maybe some of the off-the-ear processors not sticking or maybe not? Um, very, very rare. I did not have, I mean, I have um, one patient that I can remember um, and uh, and she she is, uh, you know, as she grew, I implanted her when she was very, when she's little, I think one or two years of age. And then now she's like, 16 and she um 
got a little bit overweight and then started having the problem. But uh, they've generally been able to, with different magnets um, and, and even pro different processors because, yeah. uh, you know, they, you can have a different uh, magnet strength with different processors, with different processors, they were able to get her to connect. So uh, I, I, luckily I, I have not needed to go in and thin a flap. I, I just dread that. <laughs> I think there are some people that are struggling with that. There's also some um, uh, places that have described maybe injecting some steroids superficially into the skin, um, mm -hmm. especially uh, for, I think, some of those patients who feel strongly about that off the ear uh, processor. But maybe um, we can go back to the main slide. If, if this is not something that everyone here is uh, dealing with, let's pick More something else. Oh, yes. Well, go right ahead. I just a quick, quick comment. You know, I think when you're implanting the device, you should sort of think about the patient's anatomy and, and um, you know, you're, you're worried about just getting the implant in the right spot, but you know, a very thin scalp patient, you know, I don't, I don't drill wells much anymore, but if it's a, maybe an older patient with very, very thin scalp, uh, I would go ahead and drill a well to really recess the implant. And same thing, if somebody's got a really thick scalp, instead of going subperiosteal, I may want to go above the temporalis muscle mm -hmm. and that could help, you know, just think of things like that. It'll take one of these cases to make you think of that. I'm sure. Yeah. Christine. Um, I don't think, at least in my practice, that I've had much, many issues with it. We do look at the scalp preoperatively and kind of see where it would be best. Perhaps it's not totally behind the ear, and maybe we have to twist it up a little bit just to get it to a place where um, the skin might be thinner. Um, uh, the other thing is, like, I think the audiologists really take control of this. I think you can take the magnet out and go up to like a two or three or four or five or six or seven and then double up the magnet and um, and then kind of help it stick. So um, I really rely on my audiologist to kind of help me manage some of those. Um, and if I did have to go back, then I'd make an incision behind, trim it sharp, sharply how Walter uh, had mentioned before and close up and put a really nice pressure dressing on it. Well, great, thanks. Yeah, and I think um, I think in the chat, some people are mentioning that um, that they're actually, as you said, well, maybe going through some of these algorithms and some of the tips you just mentioned. So that's really helpful. We're going to take just a couple of questions from the audience. One was um, the first one was um, for Dr. Al Kashlan and Dr. Din. How often are you able to do a pure round window cochleostomy with the um, slim medialer electrode uh, versus an extended round window? And I think uh, one other um, question has posed the issue of the sheath that comes on the perimedialar electrode. Uh, Hassan, did you want to um, just give a quick answer about sure. your experience? Yeah, I, I pretty much always do an extended round window with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of my extent. Yeah, it, it, the, the angle, um, it will be hard to put the sheath in uh, in the right angle so it doesn't, uh, you don't get it to tip fold over or, uh, you know, kind of a misdirection of the electrode. So, I pretty much almost always do, uh, except in very rare circumstances where the round window is really very nicely situated. But generally speaking, I do an extended round window for, for that. And so I, 622, I'm sorry, 622, uh, I would not. I would pre purely round window, just open the round window membrane and be able to slide the, the 622. Um, I agree with Hussam. Um, if it was a 622, almost always the round window membrane approach. Um, I am a big believer in the extended round window approach. I was trained to do that by one of my mentors, Dr. Simon Jelly, and I just love the technique. And I think with the 632, you really need to get, really get a good angle um, to be able to, you know, do this atraumatically. So um, it's almost always an extended round window approach. Well, great. Let's head back to the main screen. Uh, both of you are highlighting some things that were discussed in the house implant study group, even with some of the, uh, once the perimedialar electrode is in, we might even, there may even be some um, art to how uh, over insertion or, or tightening or twisting that electrode to improve. So I think a lot more data to come uh, in the coming years on that. All right. I think we're at uh, Mia, your turn. What, uh, what do you think here? Um, I'll take preoperative case two, please. Okay, preoperative case two. Um, I think that I think we actually pulled up postoperative. Uh, would you be? Did you say postop? I said preop, but oh, whatever. 
Either way. All right, let's go. We'll probably get through all of them. So here we go. This is um, a 30-year-old with a vestibular schwannoma in her only hearing ear and a contralaterally congenitally deafened ear. So this is obviously a devastating kind of situation. I know you personally have presented on um, on doing an implant in a contralateral ear with a uh, vestibular schwannoma in one ear. And and how, how do you approach these patients in general, vestibular schwannoma in their only hearing ear? So that is a, a very difficult problem. Um, I think that we first have to talk to the patient. If the ear has been, is congenitally deaf and has not heard um, for 30 years, the expectation of having good audiologic outcome with a cochlear implant is really, is really not very good. And I think that the patient has to be realistic about that. And it's important not to give the patient false hope that you really can get them hearing in an ear that has never heard before. Um, I would manage the acoustic if we could um, very conservatively, trying to preserve hearing in that ear for as long as possible. Um, I have had uh, patients that you can watch for quite some time. And even if it's slowly growing, you can maintain that hearing and really try to let the disease process take away hearing rather than intervening in any way to take away hearing, you know, and, and making the patient have a more difficult hearing situation. Um, that that's a really, yeah, that's a, that's a great response. Um, Hassam, yes. Um, I'll probably take a look, again, depending on the situation. I don't know how big this vestibular uh, schwannoma is. Um, the, we take probably a, a very different approach. Um, mm -hmm. So I would, um, again, I will go back to the, um, I totally agree about the, the, the fact that it's very unlikely uh, that we would give her, that person, that patient, good hearing in that ear that has been congenitally deafened. But you could potentially give them sound awareness, some sort of, you know, kind of environmental sound, sound awareness. So I would start by, if we can get a, a some positive response on a prompt stem, then I would implant that deafened ear. And if this is a tumor that is amenable to, um, uh, you know, middle fossa resection, or a posterior, if it's a small kind of a more medial uh, tumor where you would gonna go with a, a retrosigmoid approach, but whichever hearing preservation approach, if it is amenable to that, then we would go after it because this is really their only chance. Uh, yes, it's playing kind of, um, um, you know, it's, it's risky and it's, it's, it's a gamble, but the, the, the upside is, 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 is so uh, high. It's kind of life, you're changing the life trajectory of that patient completely. It's, it's the same policy we have for NF2 patients or the, 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 what we try to do for them. So we would go for it if it's uh, reasonable that we had chance that we can preserve hearing. Hassan, what if that tumor's not growing? So we will watch it first, of course. Mm -hmm. If it starts growing and still good hearing, then yes, then we will proceed because then it's most likely gonna grow, particularly in a 30, if this patient is old, older, uh, I don't have numbers because the, that's all relative now. Uh, but um, if younger patients, I would, I would um, do that. Walt, did you have a thought? Yeah. I've been blessed to have a couple of these patients. It is terrible. Um, and I agree with everything Assam said. I would try to implant that ear. Um, I mean, and I, I agree with Mia that the expectation would be very low. But someone brought up, I think, in the study groups yesterday that, you know, you get implanted and you have okay hearing one ear and that hearing goes out and all of a sudden that cochlear implant works so much better, right? Because you're yeah. – so I think getting them started with the implant and then – if you're going to try hearing preservation surgery, at least have the implant going if you do lose a hearing. In a couple of these patients, I put them on Avastin. I treat them like NF2. Um, and Avastin, um, as we all know, there's some good literature showing that uh, stops tumor growth and is good for hearing preservation. So I'll, I'll, I'll at least have them talk to our oncologists about Avastin. Sure. If, if I may also add that, I, I just had a patient like this that, you know, over the last couple of years, she she came and, and she didn't have insurance. They they wouldn't, you know, but eventually we were able to get her the implant. And then we went for the, uh, you know, uh, for the resection of the tumor. And it was a facial nerve neuroma. Mm -hmm. So we didn't, 
remove it, we but it's decompressed and when you know it was stimulating everywhere. And yeah. so uh, unfortunately, we didn't end up removing the tumor for her, but she still has her hearing and the her outcome with the cochlear implant um, started getting better and better. So she's now have had the uh, implant for about a year and a half. And early on, just some tones and that's it, nothing more. But as time went on and actually it's imp she's improving her, the, the uh, uh, word recognition is starting to happen. Christine, yeah. Um, this patient's 30 years old, so I would definitely get an NF2 genetic test because it, there's a high possibility that this patient might have NF2, and that changes a lot of things. Because if they don't have NF2, then treating this with Avastin or even enrolling in a clinical trial is almost impossible. Um, and, uh, you know, taking away somebody's hearing from surgery or from radiation or from some treatment when it was originally perfect is going to be devastating for this 30 year old that's just entering into the you know work field so i'm kind of of like kind of what M mia said um you know sometimes you have to kind of let the tumor do its thing um, otherwise the patient's going to hate you forever <laughs> and you've taken away every single opportunity this person has to have like a, a functional um, relationship and career with people and, um, and um, interacting with family. Um, so I definitely think that, you know, doing the NF2 testing is important, observing it, seeing what this um, tumor is doing, perhaps it's not growing. And if it is growing, then really analyze it. Is it really in the fundus or is it in the CPA? Can we get it and save hearing? Um, and can we save the cochlear nerve and then kind of take each patient as their own individual um, patient? I think also, Christine, the other inflection point is if it is growing, can you watch it to the point where you know you can preserve the cochlear nerve um, and then you would be able to implant? So maybe make sure that you not just you have a chance at hearing preservation, but also have a good chance that it's not so large that you're going to do so much nerve damage that you won't be able to implant. Totally. On the other end of the spectrum, has anyone had experience with um, an only hearing ear with a stable vestibular schwannoma that's undergoing some hearing degradation? Has um, anyone put a cochlear implant into a, a stable vestibular schwannoma ear? And what are anyone's thoughts about that? Yeah, we, we've done, mm -hmm. done that a few times, more with NF2, but um, I think yeah. it may be one or two patients that are just a unilateral you know, tumor. And Right. I mean, they're not going to, you know, again, I don't have a hundred patients I can compare, okay. but you know, the expectation is going to be worse. They have a tumor there. And sometimes we may radiate that tumor first um, if it is growing and then put a cochlear implant in and they seem to do, do well, you know, um, not as good as somebody without a tumor, obviously, but um, again, it's all expectations, but I think it's a real approach. Yeah. I've had at least three patients with, with this scenario. And, and again, um, you know, they're, Pretty much all of them were NF2s, and um, the um, and, and as you mentioned, the Avastin actually, uh, you know, that there's you'd be a decline in the out, you know, in the function of the cochlear implant, and then she gets the uh, Avastin cord, and then her implant scores improves again mm -hmm. um, for a while, and, and it it's had happened, you know, several cycles for her before she yeah. until she was not able to get Avastin anymore mm -hmm. because of side effects. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, fascinating. Well, we're going to jump away from this uh, this really challenging case and get back to our main slide. Uh, I think we're back to you, Christina. What What do you think? Where Where should we head now? Um, I'm going to go post operative. I think is the next case, case two. Yep, I think that's where we are. Post op case two. All right. Well, this is definitely something we're all struggling with. This is a um, the a key uh, question, sort of generally about the poor performer. So, 81 year old progressive sensorineural hearing loss, had worn hearing aids for many years, sort of a traditional candidate, had a unilateral CI, and after surgery, really not improving in the way that we might expect as far as speech perception. So how does your center handle the poor performer? Do you have, a, you know, an algorithm that you go through? How do you first approach those, that category of people that we know are out there? 
Um, so for, I guess, an older lady who's not doing very well with cochlear implants, I think looking at other factors, what is her mental state? Um, is she one that is not really um, comprehending very well or just mentally just not as sprite as maybe another 81-year-old um, person? Um, what is her social situation? Is she by herself? Is she getting stimulation? Does she have friends that are willing to work with her? Does she have family? Um, maybe some of the social factors that maybe may contribute to some of her problems before really just like thinking that it's an implant or um, maybe a programming issue, um, putting her through a very aggressive audio-verbal therapy program um, just to see if we can get that up, um, and looking at other factors, maybe medication-wise, that may be contributing to some of these um, 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 ability to process like auditory sound. Um, if, like for example, the patient doesn't have any of those issues, um, instead of just going back and uh, doing an integrity test and, you know, considering an explantation, I think, you know, I have a very close relationship to a lot of my audiologist. Um, try this, try that, increase the pulse width. Um, you know, um, there are various things that you can do with programming that might help this patient do better. And I've had patients in the, in the past that have come from different institutions or outside of the United States who had their implant done. They come in, they're like at a 20% and um, we work with them for two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, they get reprogrammed, um, reprogrammed again. Um, and uh, they come back out with like 80, 90% Mm -hmm. um, word uh, recognition scores. So yeah. I just feel like maybe going through this process would be important before really like considering integrity testing or um, an explant to see if that might be the reason why she's not doing well. Mia, do you have uh, some imaging you put people through and, and what's your um, threshold for incorporating maybe some neuropsych testing or other uh, looking into that? So I, I think it's important to really talk to the patient too. I wouldn't image right away, especially if it was my implant and I and I wasn't really concerned about uh, about its uh, location. If it's from outside, certainly. Um, but uh, the other question is, you know, how how much are they using the implant? In my patients who aren't doing well, some of it is whether they're practicing. You know, how many hours a day are they wearing the implant? And just as Christine said, you know, are they really giving it, giving it a good try? Um, and I think preoperatively, something that's really important to talk about is that it really is a process for learning. This is 10 years out, um, but that get, get them ready for the work that it takes in the first year for some of our patients to really gain that word understanding so that they know that this is part of the contract that they have to practice um, in order to get somewhere. Um, can I, just a couple of comments uh, uh, and, and related to imaging, um, as, as Mia said, again, if, if it's not, if somebody is coming up, we, the majority of us do imaging on every patient. I didn't used to do that for decades. And then once we started the um, 532 at that time study, that was, you know, we had to do an x-ray on everyone. And... Um, uh, everything went great, you know, never had a dip fold over. And then I uh, went to the first uh, uh, year uh, study, you know, kind of a, a study group. And, and uh, I show great surgeons, all of them showing all these fold over and said, if all these great surgeons are getting that, then I'm getting an x-ray on everyone to make sure I don't have that. Luckily, um, I've discovered only once through all, uh, on, only on a, on a, a 532 or a 632, I can't remember. Um, and that, and that's, you know, I re corrected, reloaded it and put it back in and it was fine. So, um, yeah. so it's, it's important if the patient is not doing well to, to make sure that the electrode, even because sometimes it may have migrated laterally. Again, it's not very common, but you, if you have a, a proof of location initially, then you know you want to make sure it's still in the same location. Um, but generally, the IAS will be able to tell you if they have good impedances on all electrodes and stuff. Then it's in the cochlea; it's not it's not anywhere else. Um, but also preoperatively, trying you know trying to avoid this in this scenario, particularly in elderly patients, because generally you only have one shot at it. You're not gonna 
it's very hard to try to go and plant the other ear. So choose the ear wisely. Sometimes patients have a just a glimpse of hearing in one ear and they want to really cling to that. And the other ear have all the top stuff we talked about, you know, 15 years not wearing a hearing aid, but they don't want, they insist on doing the bad ear. Both are bad, but they just want to cling <laughs> to that little one. Uh, and and then, then you run into the situation versus saying, you know what? No. This yeah. is really what's going to give you the best outcome, and you only have one shot at it. So um, let's implant the ear that has a, uh, you know, PDA of, of 90, not right. the one that is no response. Walt, do you ever use, um, or does your center have auditory rehab? Is that something that's an option for patients? Is that you throw that at people who maybe aren't doing well? What do you think? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I was actually about to say that auditory um, uh, verbal therapy could be very helpful. We have three private practice um, uh, people out of the community that are very good. And so they're in different locations around Dallas, Fort Worth. And oftentimes, um, you know, our audiologists do some of this, but they can, that has been very helpful with some of these patients that are really struggling. Um, send them to an uh, uh, auditory verbal therapist and that can be helpful. So we've done that a few times. I was going to say that's something you can try as well. Yeah. But a lot of it is expectations, you know, um, 81 year old patients and, you know, just don't know how, how well they'll do. And um, it, these are, these are tough. I have uh, yes, they're definitely tough. I know we're all, um, Meredith Holcomb had a comment that, um, you know, sometimes speech perception may not mean they are necessarily a poor performer. Perhaps we should uh, include quality of life improvement, which I'm sure we'd all agree on. <laughs> Let's head back to the to the main slide. And just while we're headed back there, I wanted to incorporate a question for Mia um, from Dr. Simon Angeli. And this was back in that super challenging case about the unilateral um, vestibular schwannoma and the only hearing ear. And the question was, would you consider IAC decompression of an intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma to prolong hearing? Um, and Mia, you can give an answer and if anyone else has any comments, so. I think absolutely. I think, um, you know, I think decompression has a very low risk to hearing uh, if you're, if you do it correctly. Um, I think it is important to see if the tumor is growing though, because we know that there can be hearing loss uh, that's not necessarily related to tumor growth, other factors such as possibly protein yeah. or precipitate you know, in, in the cochlea. Um, but I think for a growing tumor, especially a small one where you don't want to take away the hearing, that is a reasonable option to um, prolong their, their natural hearing. Yeah. Well, great. Let's head back to the main screen. I think we, we're moving along here and we have just a few cases left. So I think the next person, Hassam, you're up next. Uh, Do pre-op uh, case three, I think. All right. Well, this is a bit of a challenging case, and uh, as the others are. So this is bilateral Meniere's disease, really bringing into so many aspects. So this particular case my, uh, is, a, is an actual challenge. Um, she, this patient had a right-sided labyrinthectomy fairly early in life and had been doing well with an only hearing ear and in a hearing aid. But over time, that same ear developed worsening hearing loss and episodic vertigo. And now that only hearing ear was a CI candidate. I remember years ago hearing um, a very accomplished Dr. Jealous Antina talking about how for him, and in, at least at that time, um, you know, implanting an only vestibular ear uh, was, was something he was very reticent to do. And I'm wondering how would you approach that? in this patient? So um, it's, it is very challenging, as you said. And, um, um, you know, unfortunately, there are not a lot of great options. No. Um, so again, the other ear is kind of a, um, almost impossible to implant, death for 30 years. Um, maybe even ossified. So, I mean, you can get an MRI and find out if the cochlea is patent or not, but even if it is patent, um, you know, an ear that has not been stimulated for 30 years is not going to give you great um, outcomes. Um, but she is 55, correct? Yes, really so, midlife, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's not Medicare yet, so potentially you can still do bilaterally. So, uh, but but so you can, uh, but that's that's one point. Then the uh, in terms of the uh, uh, 
only hearing ear with active Meniere's disease now. Um, you, um, you can do, uh, try not to, so I would first try to, um, again, I'm assuming that all the conservative treatment has been really exhausted and not nothing. Um, trying, trying initially to, I, I don't want to, I want to avoid bilateral labyrinthectomy. Right. Yes. So, uh, you can try steroids, not very uh, optimistic about it, intratympanic, then mm -hmm. intratympanic uh, uh, genomycin, see if you can quite, quite the, the, um, you know, kind of weaken the vestibular enough, but mm -hmm. you still have some vestibular input to aid you once and then put an implant in the uh, ear that um, that has some hearing, but now, which is now a cochlear implant candidate. That's yeah. how it would. Well, thanks for sharing your perspective. You know, I'd, putting you on the spot, it's a really challenging case in thinking about all of these, the extent to which we're even able to, to impact the natural history of, um, of bilateral Meniere's disease for those patients. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on, you know, what kind of vestibular testing might you get for this um, individual going in the pre-op? And is that a, a way you approach these bilateral patients different than how you um, would approach other pre-op CI candidacy individuals. Christine, I know you have a really challenging Meniere's patient uh, that you uh, experienced. Um, I guess sometimes like, it's hard to differentiate between bilateral Meniere's and bilateral autoimmune. Sometimes like I guess yes. that presentation kind of overlaps, but definitely doing some vestibular testing to understand what the vestibular function is in this patient would be important. I probably would do a VNG, a rotary chair, and just do the comprehensive because like your next step is based on probably a lot of these tests, um, including them. Um, I just find that a lot of many years patients, especially if they're undergoing um, episodic vertigo that's interfering with their life, um, that you can't un like get under control. Some of these patients would rather be in oscillopsia than really having to deal with hours and hours of vertigo. Um, and then especially if they can't hear and function in life and work, um, it's, I guess, for them either being disabled or doing whatever they can to you know, better um, both situations. Um, and it's funny that, you know, I've had a couple of patients, which I've for many years disease, where one is just so active and they're a cochlear implant candidate one day and probably the next day not. But um, I've actually had a series of five or six where I've implanted one ear and they're hearing much better. I don't know if the stress is better mm -hmm. or whatnot, but like the other ear comes down which I find very, very interesting. Um, but in this particular patient who is in the 50s, you know, I'd counsel them and um, uh, about the natural history of many years disease. Um, I'll have the patient make their own decision about what they want to do with their life. And if they want a cochlear implant, then, you know, I would provide that to them, especially if, um, if even if they had very good function in that ear, um, I'd give them steroids, obviously, to kind of reduce everything. But I really have to take this patient's, you know, opinion into consideration yeah. because it's their life. I think uh, Dr. Eric Sargent made a comment um, that I think we uh, perhaps have all seen, but that um, ears with a transmastoid labyrinthectomy don't always ossify. So sometimes uh, we may think that that ear is down and out, but um, in a when you're up against a wall and trying to help that patient navigate what's going on, that might be an option. Um, I have a question about a Medicare payment that I thought might be useful for us to, to move into this particular patient that we're talking about was not in the Medicare age, but Dr. Rubenstein asked, if anyone has had Medicare deny payment for a second cochlear implant when the first cochlear implant um, didn't uh, achieve outcomes expected, and the patient still meets Medicare criteria. I think something that most people probably in the audience deal with is, is, try, is talking about Medicare and cochlear implants. And so perhaps this is a useful question. Um, Mia, is there, how do you all, what do you think about that question? I haven't had um, that denial problem, but I have yeah. had 
other denial problems. And my, my attack is always to contact the insurance company or contact and get a peer to peer and discuss the case. And I, I've had good success with that for certain single sided deafness cases and other cases that were initially denied. In fact, where we are actually Medicare straight Medicare doesn't require authorization um, as you're, you're, um, uh, supposed to, you know, oftentimes you're working inside Medicare criteria and then risking um, the future audit um, as far as that goes, which is probably how a lot of us are functioning. Let's head back to the main screen. We're going to be wrapping it up pretty soon. So we all have two more cases. Uh, and I think we have two more people to pick. So Walt, uh, let's let's jump to a different topic. What do you think? That was a tough case. So case three is to stay away from it sounds like. Yeah. Not as good. Let's go. Uh, let's go post op case three. All right, post op case three. Okay, well, coincidentally, I think this is not dissimilar to kind of a problem you personally uh, have experienced or maybe wrestling with a patient, a little bit different. This is a 49 year old female. She had a cochlear implant placed in the canal wall down cavity 10 years ago. Now, uh, many, of, many of us are familiar with the various options for cochlear implantation and chronic ear disease or cholesteatoma. Petrosapisectomy discussed um, very well by Dr. Herzog and others at a recent um, Doc Matter event hosted by ANS and also putting the cochlear implant into a canal wall down cavity, definitely an option. So in this setting, you have inherited this patient um, who had a uh, cochlear implant in a canal wall down cavity. And now you see the electrode is coming out from under the cartilage and you're a little bit concerned. You're looking into the mastoid at that implant. There's some cholesteatoma around the electrode. Um, let me ask you just straight away, if it's working, would you pull it or what do you think? How would, long are you going to wait? Yeah. Yeah. I have, a, I have a number of these patients all inherited. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. um, you know, I think in this situation, especially in a canal wall down cavity, it's pretty safe. Um, you could probably just do a very limited operation and maybe carefully um, uncover that area where the skin's collecting, um, you know, take not, not too much time. And then you could just clean it in clinic. I think an exposed electrode is probably unlikely that the receiver simulator is going to get infected. That's probably all scarred in and, and, and shouldn't um, pose a problem. Um, you know, I worry about trying to close that ear off. You know, one, you're going to probably have to explant the electrode and then you worry about leaving skin behind and it's going to be very hard to monitor that ear with imaging. Um, even with, um, you know, receiver simulator with the MRI compatible magnets, you're going to have so much artifact. You're not going to be able to see see anything on diffusion weighted imaging, CT scans can have a lot of artifact. You'd almost have to explain I, what I would probably do if, if I did that situation, I would do everything I could not to explain. I would close that ear. I would cut the electrode at the, at the round window, remove all the skin and probably do like a second look operation, maybe six, nine months, and then put in the new electrode. Um, mm -hmm. the other, the other question is, you know, should you implant the opposite side? And that's, I've done that before as well, before you would do any sort of explain on the, decide with the current implant. Yes, Christine. So I've had a couple of these, not of my own, <laughs> that have come through the University of Miami with these like canal wall downs, infected, draining, disgusting, and um, ultimately like le like leading to early meningitis um, and many months mm -hmm. of IV antibiotics. And if, you know, if I had a choice in a canal wall down procedure and I had to put a cochlear implant in, I'd probably start off with, let's just close off the ear, do that second look, make sure there's no cholesteatoma, perhaps maybe put a flap in, but um, then put an implant later just to prevent some of these complications from happening because meningitis is like, you know, um, is like a, a very like devastating disease to have. Um, but I do agree in this situation, if it's working and it's a clean mastoid bowl, then maybe just doing like a little touch up and covering that implant with something. Um, but if there's any infection, obviously, then, um, uh, you know, IV antibiotics, like preoperatively and counseling with regards to like swimming, swimming and not getting water in the ear, I think is very important. Um, but like, if it's really infected, just taking it out, um, putting in a depth gauge and just um, coming back a different time, you know, and um, um, I think we have to do what's good for the patient's overall health too, and just look at the bigger picture in some of these situations. Well, great. Thanks. We're going to finish with one last case. 
I think uh, Mia, you have one one last case, and we'll just have a um, a few last minutes to discuss. So I think there's just a couple left there. Um, intraoperative three, I think, is left, um, and I'll take intraoperative three. Let's go with that. All right. How do we, um, this case is just getting at, you know, sometimes, um, especially with perhaps even longer electrodes, we have an insertion that's uh, not all the electrodes are in the cochlea. Is this something that you worry about? And what techniques might you use for some of those especially longer electrodes? Sure. So um, I have had uh, a lot of med uh, implants in particular, where there are a couple of electrodes outside the cochlea. I think that for those, um, you get better insertion if you have a really good angle at, I, I do a round window insertion, a very good angle at the round window um, where you're coming at it square on. Also um, sort of guiding the electrode with um, a hook inferior to the electrode can help get that electrode more completely in. But at the same time, I don't worry about it that much. So I've had patients um, who've had a couple of electrodes that haven't been able to um, get all the way in the cochlea and they function just fine. Um, so if I'm confident in my placement and uh, it's just a matter of those electrodes being outside, I don't worry too much about it because they function well. Walt, is that something that you've uh, struggled with as well in any particular tips or um, I noticed you mentioned the Metal Flex 28 was one of your, uh, do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think as a surgeon, you just feel like if all the electrodes aren't in, you know, you didn't do the operation correctly, which is not true, but you know, you just, you just, you leave it's very frustrating. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I used to take the electrode out and try to reinsert it. You know, I think, you know, maybe a lot of it is probably direction, but it is just a flexible electrode going into cocleostomy. I mean, there's only so much you can really do with your direction. So I think if you have one or two electrodes out, as much as it frustrates me, I think maybe trying to turn the electrode um, a little bit while you're inserting it, maybe one more try is all you can do. And every time I talk to my audiologist, they're like, don't worry about it. Those patients do just right. fine. So they always let me know that, uh, I don't think they're just telling me that, but but uh, it seems like the patients do okay. So um, yeah. it's just frustrating because as a surgeon, you just don't feel like the operation was done perfectly how it should have been done. But Sure. No, that's definitely true. I don't know. Does anyone, you know, there are, um, I know Medel has the Odo plan, which is something where you can kind of map out the length of the cochlea and then match that to the length, um, which has been discussed in other forums as an opportunity. Does anyone use that? Or is that something you think about in your preoperative assessment? We did a study with Odo plan and really yeah. about every cochlea should take a 28, right, flex 28. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. so it's hard to say why they don't always go in all the way. Yeah. Um, but. Well, great. All right. I think we're going to head back. I think there's just one or two. Um, there's just one quick question from the audience that I thought's a little bit more general question, but it was about um, hearing preservation. And the discussion was from Dr. Bojarab, who asked, how long have we followed the, uh, how long have you followed your hearing preservation patients? And are you finding, um, which seems like the literature also supports to some degree, degradation of hearing in the three to five years after implantation? So let me make a comment. Most of these were not hearing preservation patients. They just had decent hearing. So we tried to, we're not trying to preserve the hearing. We're just saying, okay, we're gonna to try to do as atraumatic insertion as possible because it's good even if you don't preserve the hearing to do atraumatic insertion for the outcomes. So, but they end up with hearing preservation. And I have to make a comment uh, that the majority of these patients um, do not use when they're offered the choice between using a combined uh, map with electric and acoustic versus electric alone, they choose electric alone, which kind of you know, drives the question what, you know, other than being gentle and delicate and, and, you know, minimizing trauma to the cochlea, which should improve the outcome with electric stimulation alone. I don't know, I mean, I, I don't have in my, you know, that I remember a patient that comes to me and wearing both components, despite having residual hearing preserved. So I can't g give an answer about how long it lasts, but my guess is yes, it does degrade down the road. 
Yeah. Well, that's a great, great topic. Uh, and thanks for bringing that up. I know others have discussed, you know, who's using the acoustic hook and who's not. And you're absolutely right that we're all really focused on our part in that, which is the intraoperative, uh, you know, at least, uh, as you mentioned, the soft surgical technique. I think we're at the uh, at the end, Mark. I have to really thank all of you for your uh, willingness to share your experience, your, your opinion, and to go through this panel with all of us. I have personally learned a lot, but also really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. And thank you to the ANS for the, uh, for the opportunity to all sit around and discuss cochlear implants for this hour. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Thank you, Maura.